silence, cool tries. Williams, Bank of Philly County, Borough Council. <coughs> yes. May it please your lordships, I, I, I represent the appellant on this appeal, together with my own friend Mr. Howells. The respondent is represented by my own friends Mr. Gowdy and Mr. Dennis. Your lordship should have two bundles, uh, one bundle comprising the core bundle and the supplementary bundle, and the other containing the agreed, bun the, the agreed authority. Yes. And the first bundle should contain each side's re replacement skeleton arguments. And, my lords, I'm going to assume that your lordships have all had an opportunity to read, at the very least, the skeleton arguments, obviously the judgment, and perhaps some of the strategy document. You can assume, Mr Havens, we've done just that. We've read the documents, whether we're any wiser as a consequence of reading the, the various underlying documents is a different matter, but we've read them. Well, in that case, I think I can go straight to the grounds of appeal without more ado, and we can pick up some of the other documents as, as yeah. we go along, if that's a convenient yeah. way to proceed. Um, so, my lords, can I turn to our first ground, mm. which is that the judge was wrong to conclude that the adoption of this strategy had no cost consequences. And the key question under this ground is as to the nature of the strategy, and in particular the decision in the strategy, what we say was a firm decision in the strategy to provide these four strategic, state-of-the-art leisure centres in the four locations identified on page 183 of the strategy document, and I'll come to that in a moment. Mm -hmm. the, the council contend and the judge found that the strategy, and in particular that decision, represented no more than a policy objective which had no cost consequences, we submit that the judge was wrong, so to find, because we submit that, that uh, the strategy included the taking of a firm decision to provide those four leisure centres with the inevitable consequences to which I will come and that that was a decision which inevitably and necessarily had significant cost consequences. Does it depend <coughs> when those consequences might crystallise? Well, my Lord, we submit no, because we submit that at the time that the decision was made, um, <coughs> and this was, as I say, a firm decision... Well, wasn't it all subject to, to as it were, further consideration nor only in relation to each of them. Um, but the, what the strategy document did and what the council approved was a, a firm decision to provide those four centres, come what may. We, we can see that that was a once and for all decision in part from not just the document itself but also from the evidence of the officer responsible for... Uh, for so you would say they couldn't have, for example... Um, if at some later stage they were considering whether or not to, to, to build a centre at uh, risk or wherever it was, they couldn't have said to themselves, well, actually, now we've looked at this again, uh, we think there should be six or seven rather than four. No, I'm not saying that. Um, but what I am saying was is that at the time that the decision was taken in November 2018, uh, there was no suggestion that, the, that that decision was going to be revisited at any stage in the future with a view to, at that later stage, assessing the overall likely costs of the exercise. So that as at, the, at the time that the decision was taken, um, it was at that stage a, a once and for all decision to provide those uh, four strategic leisure centres with, with the consequences, we say inevitable consequences, that follow. I mean, you'll come to the um, wording of the regulations in due course, but don't, don't you need to identify something in an existing budget yes. or capital expenditure plan um, which the uh, decision is contrary to. Uh, I, um, I, not very well expressed, but I hope you get the point. Um, and uh, if, for example, it 
was a, even if it was a firm decision, but it wasn't going to happen for another five or six years, or even nine or ten years, um, as I understand it, the budgets and the expenditure plans don't go ahead that far. No, they, they don't, but as we shall see, within months of the November 2018 decision, Cabinet took two decisions which had inevitable cost consequences in relation to the then current budgets. The first was to close the particular um, uh, leisure centre with which the appellant is concerned. That's the uh, Pontal Fry. Fry, Pontal and Fry one, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And the second was to invest £550,000 in one of the four identified strategic centres, that's to say the centre at Newbridge. So within months of the November 2018 strategy decision, those further decisions were, were taken, which, which we say uh, represented the implementation of the uh, decision taken in November 2018 and plainly concerned the then... But isn't that... Um, uh, and that sounds like a challenge to those decisions, but isn't that uh, hindsight? Because there's nothing, as I see it, in the strategy which says that this has to be done within the current yes. year. Six months. Well, the, the, well there, there are two budgets that are relevant. One is the 2019-2020 budget, and the other is the 2019 2022 <coughs> capital expenditure budget. So at the time that the decision was made in November 2018, it, it, it wasn't just the, the then current budget, 2019-2020, or I, I should say, sorry, the, the then current budget was obviously 2018-2019, um, but it wasn't just that budget uh, or the budget that followed the 2019-2020 budget. It was also the capital expenditure budget for 2019 to 2022, uh, and that, that that's several years uh, hence, as it were, from the from the November 2018 decision. Uh, and there must have been, uh, at the time that the decision was taken in November 2018, a real likelihood uh, that um, uh, some expenditure on the provision of those four. Uh, strategic centres would have been made if if um, if the strategy had any real purpose to it. It, it. it seems unlikely that the council would then have sat on its on its hands for three plus years following that decision and done absolutely nothing to to carry into effect the strategy which had been approved. But does does that con convert a decision, or as you put it, firm decision? something that was set in concrete or what's the legal analysis that, that fits? So the, the legal analysis is that at the time that the strategy was approved and this decision was taken in, 20, in November 2018, we say that uh, there were then obvious cost consequences to the decision. And the, the, the decision was not to um, provide one centre at one location uh, and to close one existing centre at one other location. It was to provide four centres uh, and the, inevitably the consequence would be that, that there were ten at the time in existence. So of the, uh, the other six, four were um, what, what, what we'll see were referred to as, um, uh, as joint use facilities and the intention was that they would be transferred to the, the joint user, uh, leaving two which we say would inevitably be closed. Now in order to um, uh, uh, assess the merits and indeed the affordability of the strategy and in particular this decision in November 2018, um, it was essential, we submit, uh, that uh, Cabinet uh, should have some idea of the likely overall costs of this decision. In other words, um, what would be the likely costs of providing the four uh, strategic centres? What would be the likely costs of running them? What would be the likely costs of 
transferring or closing the remaining centres and what would be the likely savings as a result of transferring or closing those centres. Is this now moving into ground two? I'm, I'm moving into ground two in order to illustrate, what, to, to provide my answer to my Lord Justice Haddon Cave's question. Um, none of that information, because grounds one and two inevitably overlap to yes. some extent, yes. um, none of that information was available to Cabinet when it took this decision. It, it, it wasn't provided in the officer's report, it wasn't asked for, uh, and thus Cabinet was um, completely unaware of what the overall costs of this exercise were going to be. What, what would be the practicability of providing that information? Wouldn't, wouldn't the answer vary enormously depending on whether you do it all in year one or all in year ten or spread it out over the course of the ten years? Well, well that's, that's a my myriad of possibilities that, even that. if you simply focus on the centres which are going to be closed or transferred and the four which are going to be either created or developed. Well, well, that, of course, is one of the points that the judge uh, makes in, in support of his, his interpretation of the strategy document and the decision that was taken. But what true it is that at the time that um, the uh, decision was made in November 2018, there was no way that the Cabinet could be sure about what the costs of implementing the decision were going to be. Mm. But it's, uh, it, uh, it by no means follows we submit, that um, uh, the Cabinet could be excused for not having available to it any information as to the likely cost of the exercise. That information could have been provided, and I'll show you in a moment uh, an earlier example, mm. could have been provided on a number of different alternative bases. Um, I mean, the my law puts to me, well, the cost might have been different in, in uh, 2025, for example, seven years down the line, than they would be in um, 2018. Uh, and the, the Cabinet would have appreciated that. But the, but the notion that projects such as this are never um, uh, uh, agreed upon um, in the absence of at least some information as to the likely costs or some estimate of the likely costs is, is we submit, fanciful. Um, any uh, uh, sensible decision maker approving such a project would be bound to do so only after being provided with uh, at least some information as to the likely costs of the exercise. Now, that takes me back to the point I made earlier that that there was no suggestion when this decision was taken that the decision would be revisited at some future date with a view to, at that stage, uh, looking uh, assessing what the overall costs were and seeing whether the project was affordable or not in the light of the cost consequences and the cost information which would have been provided. This, this was the opportunity to uh, ask for uh, and to be provided with those cost consequences. And, and we submit um, that um, uh, it, it was unlawful for the for Cabinet to take that decision without having any idea what the, co what the cost would be. And I'm sorry, sorry my Lord, can I just complete my, my very, very lengthy answer to your Lordship's question. Uh, and it was clear from the decision taken uh, uh, in November 2018 that, any, uh, that, that the only assessment of costs thereafter was going to be in relation to individual leisure centres. In other words, they were going to be, the, the, the costs were going to be assessed only by reference to um, uh, this individual centre or that individual centre. So there was, there was never going to be, at a later stage, any uh, overall assessment of the affordability of what was decided in November 2018. Well, that, that's our case in a paragraph, or rather several really, paragraphs. Really, really helpful. Does it, make, does it make a difference that, as you said, they started off with 10, 
Yeah, we're going to, in a sense, transfer four to schools and the other users. Yes. And then we're going to close two and then, in a sense, build up the four remaining. But, in a sense, they're not, they weren't going to build ten new ones and therefore, obviously, it was a major cost implication. They were in the happy position of having ten, which they were going to rationalise. So the cost aspects and affordability um, were not um, so stark, let's put it that way. It was I understand your Lordship's point. Um, my answer would be this. The, the um, decision taken was to provide, <coughs> I put it in shorthand, for state-of-the-art um, uh, uh, leisure centres. The, the words used in the strategy were for high-quality, multi-service leisure centres. Um, the, how to go about doing so would have involved, we submit, um, a, a number of options. One would be a new build, and, and I'll take you probably sooner rather than later to the, um, the 2017 reference to um, a, a not dissimilar exercise in Carefilly, where one of the options was a new build. Or the other option would be to expand and to obviously substantially improve the existing centres. Upgrade. Yes. Up, up, upgrade so that they, they reach the state of the art or whatever yeah. was, was understood was required. Now, we, do, we don't know, uh, and um, there's nothing in the officer's report to suggest that the council were told uh, the, about the extent to which uh, an upgrade would be required. What one strongly suspects that uh, a, a significant upgrade would be required because otherwise they wouldn't need to be talking about providing high quality multi-service leisure centres. And we know that many of these services were spread around the district council's um, area. So to the extent that they were now restricting themselves to only four would involve pulling together a fair number of the services being provided elsewhere under one, under four separate roofs. So my first uh, answer to your Lordship's question is, well, um, the probability is that a fair amount of work, if not a lot of work, would be required. And I make the point in parenthesis that, again, the, the Council had no means of knowing what the likely cost of that would be. Mm. And, and on the other hand, um, nor did they know what the savings would be from closing the existing, uh, transferring or closing the existing centres. I, I can understand that at first sight one might think that restricting oneself to, um, or the council restricting themselves to four out of ten and closing the others might uh, uh, suggest that the uh, uh, um, overall uh, uh, costs consequence would be favourable, but that's certainly not an assumption that they could have made. Uh, and um, Well, I suppose it would depend, would it, on whether the four were going to be new builds or or no, no, no. refurbs or whatever, no, because no. if they were rebuilds yes. uh, or a complete new build, then the overall cost might turn out to be uh, as great, if not greater, than it, it, existing. No, that, that, that's precisely the, the uncertainty that uh, I say should have been addressed at the um, uh, November 2018 meeting, because sometimes it's cheaper to knock something down and, and build yeah. again, but other times it may be actually cheaper to improve the four, the four identified locations yes. were all locations where there where there was an existing facility. C correct. But I, I'm the mates in there in the main towns, aren't they? Yeah. Well one of them's Blackwood, I think. Yes, I, I my risk knowledge of, of the local geography down there isn't as good well, as it's part of the world I know a bit. Oh right. Um, yeah. But they hadn't decided in the strategy, had they, in the case of any of the four um, which were going to be the mm. strategic centres, no, they, so called. No, they knew where they were going to be, yes. but they hadn't decided in any of those cases whether it was going to be a new build yeah. or, or an upgrade, and, and therefore you're saying that for all four, they should have produced cost estimates on both alternative bases, or what? You know what, I, you know what I, I am. Can I, can I take you to the document I've been <coughs> promising to take you to for, for, for some time, um, which... Um, Related to um, the um, <coughs> position in Care Philly, 
Yes, if your Lordships will go to the, the documents bundle at page 193. Yeah, um, 193. 193. Now, as you'll see from 186, this was the officer's report to the scrutiny committee mm. who met before the cabinet met in November 2018. And at paragraph 7.6 on yeah. page 193, you will see this proposals developed by Sport and Leisure Services in partnership with Alliance Leisure in 2017 identified four options to address Carefully Leisure Centre, namely, do nothing, two, refurbishment option one, mm. refurbishment option two, new build option. Mm. Uh, and figures were provided um, for each of those options. So it had been possible in 2017 for the officers to provide estimate or likely figures for four alternative options in relation to that leisure centre. And if it had been possible for the officers to do that in 2017 in relation to Care Philly, then we submit it was entirely possible and plausible for them to be asked to provide such information to Cabinet before Cabinet took its decision. Your Lordships will note, of course, the three lines that follow in paragraph 7.6 at the end of that paragraph, yeah, really the qualification. Uh, absolutely. But that's no more than, than uh, would be understood by any decision maker um, who takes a decision to embark upon a building project of one sort or another. Yeah. I mean, that, as I said before, that decision maker would, we submit, be very unlikely and, and most unwise to take his decision without any idea as to what the uh, likely costs were going to be. Yeah, Philly was going to be one of the four. Yeah, so, if you go so, to, so effectively, yeah. once you factor in the um, uh, 12 months inflation, they've given figures for one of the four. Correct. So your point really is that they should have done a similar thing for the other three. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yes. Mm. Well, they're all identified on page 183, aren't they? 183 is, is, the, is the key page in the strategy yeah. rule, yes. Risk of Cassini, Newbridge, and then one in the Bravo. And the one, the one that's um, on, on the document was um, as yet unidentified, had by the step, by the time that the decision was taken, been identified as um, Hail the National Centre. Sorry, say again? The, 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 the fourth yes. had, had been identified by them as um, a, a leisure centre at Hail the. That I'm told is the correct pronunciation, but the spelling is H E O L D D U. Sorry, spell that again, please. H E O L D D U. Thank you. That was that was the one that was in the Bargoid, uh, Abbot Bargoid area, north of the borough, Correct. top of top of the valley or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to. Yeah, I mean, for what it's worth, if we're looking at page 183, yes. the way in which that sentence is phrased suggests that the, the, the three, Risca, Caffili, and Newbridge, are existing. And we know Caffili was, because we can see that from the other document showed us. Yes. Whereas the one in the Bargoid, Bargoid areas was one that was going to be built because otherwise they'd have identified exactly where it was. Uh, I, Lord, can I, th I, I think that the Hale um, the Leisure Centre existed already, but can I just... Well, maybe, I suppose if there were three in that area, then they'd be saying, well, one of the ones in, the, in that area. Well, I, th I think the... Yes. Well, that may be the case. Mm. But, but your point remains the same uh, either way, that if you can provide the... the, the um, Analysis in relation to one of them. Why, why can't you provide it in relation to the others? Right. 
And of course, the, 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 the consequence of that, or one of the many consequences of not doing so, is that at the time that the <coughs> cabinet took that decision, um, as we see on page 183, um, they, they had no way of telling whether actually the consequences of the decision um, would um, uh, uh, result in uh, a reduction in the budget of the council, which was one of the specific objectives which um, underpinned the decision that was taken uh, in relation to what's set out at page 183. Um, uh, the, um, if, if one goes back in the, in the strategy, please, to page 174, Yes. Under the heading Major Financial Challenges, um, Fairfilly County Borough Council has already made considerable savings in recent years, um, but savings of over 34 million are still needed in the next three years. That's the overall picture. For the most part, sport and active recreation provision is not a statutory requirement of local government. And although Carefilly is committed to maintaining frontline services, it does recognise things need to cha change. And then this, the community and leisure services budget must achieve reductions over the course of this strategy. And, th and then can I just read the, the next four lines? Uh, the more effective use of our many different community facilities will need to be part of the future offer to increase activity levels. This strategy also makes the case for rationalisation, enabling some savings to be used to enable investment alongside innovation and transformation. So under, underpinning the whole exercise was the need, stated need to reduce the, um, the community and leisure services budget. And secondly, the need for rationalisation, in other words, to reduce the number of leisure centres no doubt, in order to try to achieve that uh, overarching objective, but without any uh, information as to the cost consequences of the proposal set out at page 183. There was no way that Cabinet could know, could have any idea whether, the, whether that proposal would achieve that objective. Indeed, they, they, they had, they'd have no idea whether, at the end of the day, it would turn out that, uh, that turn out to be less costly to provide those four uh, strategic leisure centres and to transfer or close the other ones than it would be to keep the existing leisure centres running. Uh, 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 and it, the, the figures, for all we know, might have shown either to the contrary or might have shown that the, that the costs were likely more or less to be the same in which case there wouldn't be any saving in the budget, uh, in which case the, the um, rationalisation, rationalisation exercise set out at page 183 uh, wouldn't be achievable. But they had no, the Lordships have my point, they had, they had no cost information at all to enable them to take a view about that. Lords, that, that this was a firm decision um, is supported not just, we submit, by the, the, the um, relevant paragraph, subparagraph on page 183 itself, but also by um, what um, is said by uh, Mr. Hartshorn, who um, was at the time, well, I know he still is, the officer charged with the development and implementation of the strategy. If your Lordships would go please to page 264 behind tab 22. You will see in paragraph one he, he explains that that was part of his role, the last sentence. And then can I ask you please to go to page 267, paragraph 17.
Um, the council has ten leisure centres, more than any other local authority in Wales. The strategies focus on four strategic leisure centres um, uh, accessible by public transport, aims to ensure, so far as reasonably practical, geographic coverage across the county borough. There's no statutory requirement for the council to provide these facilities, and this represents a fair and just allocation of resources that will deliver continued sport and leisure provision into the future for the benefit of all. Um, now, I make two points about paragraph 17. The first is that that makes it clear beyond peradventure that this was a, um, a once-and-for-all decision, obviously subject to the Cabinet deciding further down the line to revisit it, about which there was no suggestion that they would. But this was a once-and-for-all decision, whereby the Council would um, uh, simply provide and support these four centres, uh, and the rest will either be transferred or would have to close. But, but the other point is that when he talks about a fair and just allocation of resources, Again, there was no way that the council, the cabinet, could have assessed whether that was right or not without at least some information about the likely cost consequences of what they were being asked to approve. Um, because I, I indicated that within months, um, two decisions were taken which um, uh, necessarily concerned, must have concerned the Council's budget, and uh, uh, then current um, budgets. Um, the first was to close um, uh, Pontville Frith Leisure Centre, or Pont, as, as I'm told it's, it's known as. Um, and the second was to invest 550 £550,000 in the Newbridge Leisure Centre, which was one of the four strategic yeah. centres which had been identified in the decision. See if you'd be good enough to go to page 204 behind tab 19. Um, this was part of the officer's report for the, um, the scrutiny committee meeting which preceded the cabinet meeting which approved the Closure. Lord, I ought to make clear I object to the admissibility of this. It was a document that was available at the time of Mr Justice Smith's Swiss hearing, but was not before him. And certainly neither of the first two Ladd and Marshall criteria are satisfied. Lords, of course, I have no objection at all to your Lordships looking at it, de bene esse. Uh, but uh, I, I must register that I d do take a point on admissibility should your Lordships at any point think that it had the slightest relevance. Well, it's a, sub it's a subsequent document. And, of course, the it's decision, much after the, the event. The decision that's under challenge is, is one made in November 18. Oh, it's not, I'm sorry, it's not this document. It's another document of the same date to which the point applies. I thought there was, I thought you, you, you invited us to take out of our bundles um, some meeting, some minutes of meeting. I think that's the document I refer, my own friend is referring to. Uh, yeah. not, of a meeting of the, of, of the strategy committee. Uh, um, unfortunately, speaking for myself, I'd already read them before you told us we couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't seek to take it any further, uh, but it is, of course, months after the event. I mean, your, your point about, um, it's not so much a point about admissibility so far as this is concerned, is that it's, it's a subsequent decision. Indeed. And the issue is one of hindsight. But I think Mr. Havis is saying, well, I suppose you put it colloquially as the proof of the pudding was in the eating. Well, well, uh, within a matter of four months, yes. they're actually doing something concrete. Well, that's, that's, that's exactly how I do put it. Yeah. And, and, and I well, in fact, the, um, uh, perhaps the writing was on the wall because the, um, there had been a previous uh, deferral of the question about the Pont 
leisure centre, um, pending adoption or not of the strategy. Yeah, yeah. That, that's absolutely right. Uh, uh, there had been an earlier decision to close it that had then been reviewed and deferred until after the strategy decision had been made. Uh, and so there, were, there, there was that further reason why it was inevitable that um, Pont Leisure Centre would, would be closed. Um, but I, I anyway, so far, so far as tab um, 19 is concerned, yeah. that was before the judge. Then, wasn't it, it? it was before yes. the judge. Yeah. Okay. But, but I think my own friend was, is, is mistaken. He was referring to the minutes yeah. of that yeah. meeting. Yeah. Mm. Yes, <coughs> they weren't before the judge, and I'm not going to invite you to look at them unless you ask me. The um, where do we pick up the spending of the five hundred fifty thousand? Well, no, we pick that up actually not in this document. We pick that up in um, uh, page two five eight behind tab twenty one. So this is now April. Now, this, this, is the, <coughs> this is the minutes of the Cabinet meeting held, held in April, April when they first approved the closure of the Pont Leisure Centre. Yeah. And secondly, as we see from page 258, they um, approved the mm. investment of £550,000 in the, and it's that you pick that up in the foot, towards the foot of the page, resolved that for the reasons outlined in the officer report, a one-off investment of £550,000 to support facility improvement, developments and equipment purchase in the fitness suite at Newbridge Leisure Centre. And it also says where the money is going to come. It, it, I was about to come, come to that because that's, that's obviously relevant in a, few, in, in, a, in a later stage of the, um, of the argument. But you will see that, your audience will see that um, uh, over half that money was to come from a completely different capital budget, the corporate asset management capital budget, uh, and the rest, well, uh, your ships can, can see where the, the balance was, was going to come from. So, um, proof of the pudding in, in the eating, as my Lord Justice Flo says, that's, that is our, our point about that. Um, they were both, uh, um, we say, steps taken to implement the, the November 2018 decision. Um, now, uh, that being the case, we submit that it was that the decision in 2018 was uh, inevitably concerned with the council's two budgets, the 2018-2019 and the uh, budget and the 2019-2022 capital budget. Um, and it may also be concerned with borrowing. We don't we don't know. Um, because the decision would have the cost consequences I have sought to explain to your lordships. Yeah. Now it's common ground that those costs were not those cost consequences were not included in either of those budgets. So we submit, and I'll show your lordships the, the relevant statute provisions in a moment. We submit that the decision, therefore, was the determination of a matter contrary to or not wholly in accordance with the Council's budget or approved plan or strategy for borrowing or capital expenditure. Those are the words of the relevant provision we'll look at in a moment. And therefore, the decision was one which Cabinet, in other words, the Executive, had no power to make. It was a decision that should have been made by the full Council. Can, can I show your Lordships uh, unless I don't need to, because you, you've looked at them already, the, the relevant statutory provisions yeah. which, which um, provide for those steps. Um, can you, could you go first to um, uh, uh, tab four of the authorities bundle, the Local Government Act of 2000? And um, section 13, which is paginated internally, top right-hand corner, uh, page 70. And 13.1 provides, this section has effect for the purposes of determining the functions of a local authority 
which are the responsibility of an executive of the authority under executive arrangements. Subject to any provision made by this Act or by any enactment which is passed or made after the day on which this Act is passed, any function uh, of a local authority which is not specified in regulations under subsection 3 is to be the responsibility of an executive of the authority under executive arrangements. Mm. And then 3, which provides that Welsh ministers, ministers may make such regulations. So can I take you to the regulations behind? Before we do, my lord, perhaps while you have section 13 of the 2000 Act open, your lordships could look on internal page 71 at subsection 10, little a, function, any function which is the responsibility of an executive under executive arrangements may not be discharged by the authority. So it has to be the executive, not the whole council. So in order to, to, to see whether to see what, what functions um, uh, may not be decided by the executive, can we go to tab 5 um, and, and regulation 6 of the 2007 regulations, um, subject to paragraph 2, um, which I think everyone agrees doesn't apply, a function of any of the descriptions specified in column 1 of schedule 4, which, but for this paragraph, might be the responsibility of an executive of the authority, is not the responsibility of an executive in the circumstances specified in column two in relation to that function. So if we go over the page, we, we see um, the relevant um, uh, columns. Uh, on the left-hand side, the function column uh, paragraph 2, the determination of any matter in the discharge of a function which A is the responsibility of the executive and B is concerned with the authority's budget or their borrowing or capital expenditure. So if I persuaded your lordships that the decision in November 2018 was concerned with the authority's budget uh, 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 and its capital expenditure, and for all we know it's borrowing as well, and I'm halfway there, but, the, but I need then to take your lordships to circumstances in the right-hand column. The individual or body uh, by whom, the individual or body by whom, by virtue of any of sections 14 to 17 of the Local Government Act, or provision made under sections 18 or 20 of that Act, the determination is to be made, is minded to determine the matter contrary to or not wholly in accordance with one, the authority's budget, two, um, the plan or strategy for the time being approved or adopted by the authority in relation to their borrowing or capital expenditure, and B is not authorised by the authority's executive arrangements, financial arrangements, standing orders or other rules or procedures to make the determination of those terms. So just putting that together, it, it follows that if the uh, decision of the 18th of December was concerned with the authority's budget or capital expenditure or perhaps it's borrowing as well. Uh, and if that decision uh, was not wholly in accordance with the budget or the, or the um, capital expenditure uh, and provided that the authority had not authorised um, the executive to make that determination and there's no suggestion that this authority had done so, then, because of Section 6, that was a decision which it was not the responsibility of the executive to make, but therefore the responsibility of the full council. Now, I've, I've probably already said enough about why we say the... So just, just before we leave those regulations, um, I see that uh, paragraph one, uh, it talks about the adoption or approval of a plan or strategy, Yes. which um, uh, looks as if the effect of that is that that can be done by the executive unless the full authority reserves it to, to itself. Now, most 
plans or strategies are going to have financial implications over their course because everything costs money. Um, but doesn't that indicate that, um, uh, at any rate, the primary uh, provision dealing with plans or strategies um, is uh, to be sought in paragraph one? And does that have any bearing on how paragraph two should be construed? Um, we, would, we, we would submit that um, um, it all depends on what the strategy says and what the decision that the strategy involves amounts to. Um, uh, so we would submit that it's, for present purpose, it's, uh, it's sufficient to um, contend that this strategy plainly had cost consequences because it was not simply the setting of a plan or a purpose, but involved the making of a firm decision to provide four specific leisure centres with the inevitable consequences that we have sought to identify. <coughs> and that it's that that brings the decision in this case uh, fair and square into paragraph two in the left-hand column. Um, I mean, if, if the strategy had been in such general terms, <coughs> in other words, if if it had not included um, the decision to provide those four leisure centres, um, then, as it were, we'd be having a different discussion about uh, the nature of the strategy and, um, and, and um, whether it could, uh, uh, whether it had any cost consequences that could have been and should have been identified at the time. But the strategy with which your lordships are concerned, we submit for reasons I've outlined, plainly did. Uh, and, and it's that that brings it within paragraph two of, of column one. Yeah. Um, Lord, I've, I've already made submissions as to why we say the decision uh, concerned the authority's budget and capital expenditure. And I think I've already said enough to explain why we submit that the decision was not wholly in accordance with the budget uh, or the capital expenditure. Well, you, you say it's, com it's common ground that, that it wasn't the 550,000 wasn't included in, in the existing budget. Yes. And, and I can say that it's common ground that no other costs, consequences of the November 2018 decision were included in either of those budgets. So it, it must follow that the decision was not wholly in accordance with uh, either of the then current uh, budgets. Uh, and well, which, which decision? Uh, is it the decision to adopt the strategy or is it the decision to spend the 550,000? It's the decision to adopt the strategy and to decide to provide those. those um, uh, the, it, it's primarily that decision. I mean, as it, as it happens, it would also be the, the later decision. But in order to succeed on this appeal, I need to persuade your lordships that it's the first decision. And that's what I seek to do. And if that's right, then the decision is unlawful because it should have been taken by the council, not by cabinet. Um, can I just ask your lordships to look at, if this would assist, what, how the judge dealt with this in his judgment? Um, if your lordships would go to page 58 of the bundle. sets out the strategy um, or, or, or refers to parts of the strategy up to page 183 uh, and says um, about five lines in on consideration of the document it is clear that it is genuinely a strategy document we make the, the obvious point that um, uh, 
yes, it, it is, but um, a, a strategy document may include some firm decisions to be taken as part of the strategy, which is what we say uh, was done in the present case. Mm. Um, then paragraph 10, he addresses uh, the point based on the decision to provide these four centres. Uh, and um, towards the end of that paragraph, about two-thirds of the way through, he refers to, to page 183, essentially, uh, as he says, that is a policy objective rather than a hard-edged plan. Uh, and I think your audience will have appreciated that we would take issue with that. Uh, this was not merely a policy objective at page 183. Uh, 183. It wasn't even actually a plan, whether hard-edged or otherwise. It was a firm decision to provide those centres with all the consequences that would inevitably follow. Um, Lord, he, he next says, and makes a point that, that uh, my Lord Lord Justice Mayo was, was making to me earlier, that the, the, the costs or other implications of that objective could significantly change over the 10-year life of the strategy, to which my, our answer is the answer I gave to, to, to my Lord. Yes, but that doesn't mean that you can't be provided with uh, an estimate of the costs uh, at the outset. And then in the <coughs> last sentence, he says, put shortly, the sports <coughs> strategy is a demonstration of intent, that the way in which or the extent to which that intent becomes manifest in the course of the next 10 years is not set in stone. Obviously, we contend, we take issue with that. This was more than a demonstration of intent, uh, and uh, it was uh, at least the decision to provide those centres with the inevitable consequences was set in stone in the sense that that was uh, the decision uh, which would apply unless at some later date Cabinet revisited it uh, and changed it, uh, about which there's no suggestion that it proposed to do so. Um, in other words, paragraph 11, um, about just, just over halfway through, um, he says the, actually, yes, towards the, foot, towards the foot of the page, the sports strategy contained no decision that committed the council as a matter of law to specific expenditure, capital expenditure or borrowing. Well, true it is that it, it didn't commit the, the, the council to um, uh, detailed specific costs, <coughs> but it did commit the council to specific expenditure and capital expenditure in the sense that it committed it to the ex expenditure and, and, and capital expenditure which would be required to provide those four centres. And then he goes on, the fact that the sports strategy might be described as a plan that if implemented would inevitably entail capital expenditure of council funds is not to the point that we, we take strong issue with that. We say there's no question of this being a plan that might or might not be implemented in the future for, for reasons I've already uh, set out. Um, we say this was a plan that was to be implemented. Um, and then paragraph 12 well I've this is where he makes the point about the expenditure not being in the, or the in the cost consequences not falling within the two then relevant budgets. I've addressed that point already and I don't need to say any more. Well, there's one final, quite separate point on the ground one, which um, we address in paragraph 34 of our skeleton argument. Um, a judge. <coughs> one finger in paragraph 34 and go to <clears throat> page 58 of the judgment, um, paragraph 6, paragraph 8, I'm sorry, paragraph 8, um, rather curiously that the judge decided uh, that contrary to what was agreed by both parties, which was that the function being 
the relevant function being exercised here was a function under section 19 of the relevant Local Government Act, that the judge decided that a better fit was section 111 of the Local Government Act. Um, we, can I just briefly... Does that matter? Well, uh, Lord, only to this extent. Um, it, when we get to um, the third ground, which is concerned with the improvement object, the, the um, improvement uh, duty <coughs> under section 2 of the, uh, the 2009 Welsh measure, um, it, it may be relevant to to, to be able to identify what the function was that, the, that this local authority was actually exercising at the relevant time. That, that's its only potential relevance. Okay. Um, I mean, the, the, the two provisions are at tabs one and two in the authorities bundle. Um, we say that the, uh, and indeed, uh, uh, the council positively submitted below, as the judge records in that paragraph, so it's tab two, that um, the, uh, the relevant statutory provision is the local government, section 19 of the Local Government Act 1976. And that's our position today, my lord. Right. Well, then the judges just we agreed on that. Agreed. <laughs> so the judge's view is wrong. Yes, I, I agree with your lordship. With respect, it doesn't matter. But we do. But if it's Parties, common ground that it's, it, the function is being exercised under section 19 of the 1976, the 1976 Act, yes. that, that's the basis on which we proceed. Yes. The fact that Mr. Justice Swift uh, may have thought um, another section of another Act was more appropriate is his view, but yes. not relevant for present purposes. No, indeed. Yeah. Thank you very much. But before I move on to ground two, I'm, I'm reminded that I have um, not mentioned one further. And now, final point on ground one, which, which is this: that the five hundred fifty thousand pounds that was um, uh, to be invested in the new bridge leisure centre, as per the decision in April twenty nineteen, there was no uh, the, the, the council had no power to transfer money from some other budget to what was the leisure. The, the community and leisure services budget, and I don't understand it, not as my junior who uh, 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 did the case below, that, that it's ever been suggested that it had. So um, th th there's no answer that can be provided. Well, it, the, um, that decision was not um, uh, 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 not in accordance with the the, the two budgets. Um, it, it 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 must have been because there was no power. Uh, given to the executive to transfer m capital from one budget to another. That's that's a short one. Uh, unlike, is it the Buck case where yes. there was such a... There, there uh, was, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I, I haven't taken your lordships to the, to the Buck case yet. It sounds as though at least some of your lordships have, have noted it, and you would have seen what Lord Dyson held as to the, <clears throat> the meaning of the various provisions that I've taken you to already. But I wasn't planning to to, to show you, but, but your is, is absolutely right. There was, in that case, but a specific arrangement whereby the mayor and any cabinet could, could, could do so. And, of course, it was never suggested in Buck that, um, that the decision in that case to remodel the provision of, of um, library services um, did not concern the, the council's budget. The, the question in that case was whether was whether the decision was not in accordance with the um, with the budget. Yes. Mm. Lord, can I can I then turn to our second round? Um, uh, 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 some of which I've covered already, inevitably, in answering your your lordship's earlier questions. Uh, we say, regardless of ground one, the likely costs of the strategy, in particular, the decision to provide these four state of the art leisure centres was a very important consideration which was highly relevant to the decisions which Cabinet was being asked to make and that the judge was wrong to hold otherwise. Um, I've, I've already indicated what information we say could and should have been provided. Um, and and we, we don't just rely on we don't just say that the information should have should have involved the uh, an estimate of the costs of providing the four leisure centres, but also also ought to have provided some 
uh, uh, estimate of the costs uh, that were likely to be involved in running these now uh, almost certainly much higher quality multi-service leisure centres, what those were likely to be, what were likely to be the costs of transferring or closing the other six leisure centres, and very importantly, what were likely to be the savings from transferring those other leisure centres or closing them down altogether. Uh, and without at least some cost information in relation to those matters, mm -hmm. um, the council, or cabinet I should say, um, uh, failed to take into consideration a, a manifestly critically important factor. Of course what they should have done was to ask for that information from the officers um, and only take the decision once it had been provided. Yeah. But, but the result of not doing so was that they took the decision without any idea whatever as to those likely cost consequences. All, all in the context, as I've said, of a stated need in the strategy to reduce the relevant community and leisure centres, centres budget. Um, I should add that, as we say in our skeleton, one of the key purposes of the strategy was to rationalise the position of, or the provision of these leisure centres, and I've, I've made that point already, and we've described that in our skeleton argument as, as making the provision of those leisure centres more efficient. Again, impossible for the, the Cabinet to decide whether... Um, they would be more efficient without any of those costs, consequences being provided to them. Um, well, you, need, you, you, you say you'd need to have some assessment of what the, what the costs were running those leisure centres as, as they were, um, what the costs would be of any renovation or rebuild or whatever it was, and then whether the cost thereafter would lead to efficiency savings such that overall there was a reduction in, in the budget. Correct. And, then the same, and then the same exercise in relation to the closure or a similar exercise in relation to those which were going to be transferred or closed. Yes, sir. Well, it may be even more complex because it looks as though um, some or perhaps most of those which were going to be closed or transferred were in a pretty bad state. They were quite old and needed a lot of work done on them. So um, the, the cost of not closing them would have to factor in yes. the um, expenditure which would be incurred to do whatever was needed to keep them running. Well, absolutely. Yeah. So in summary, you say that the cabinet was fiscally blind when they took this decision. Yes. That's when they say so. Very I don't think I need, I was going to take lordships to what the judge said about this, but essentially he, he, he was saying that um, the fact that there was no uh, commitment to any specific expenditure or any specific programme of work um, means that um, uh, uh, cost consequences or excuses the, the council from um, asking for and being provided with um, at least some idea of the cost consequences, but well, I, I, I don't think I need to take time doing that. And, and unless well, in, in a sense, um, I mean, no disrespect, Mr. Davis, but grounds one and two really are, if you like, facets of the same point, yes. aren't they? they are. I mean, they, they, are. they stand or fall together. Yes. I mean, if the judge was right in his assessment as to um, the tentative nature of the strategy, then in, in one sense that defeats both your first and second ground. In one sense it does. I suppose my second ground is a, is a much more general ground, which doesn't depend on persuading your lordships that the well. decision was concerned with the budget and was not wholly in accordance with it. But your lordship is absolutely right, if I may say so, that the, um, the, there is a significant overlap between grounds one and two. Yeah.
Well, then, can I come to the, the final ground, ground three? Um, at, at the hearing below, the, the appellant contended that the uh, council had failed in its obligations under sections two and five of the Local Government Wales Measure 2009, in that it had failed to comply with its section two improvement obligation, that's what it's called, as regards efficiency, because it had no information as to the likely costs of implementing the strategy, and in particular the decision. So there is further overlap uh, in ground three. Mm. And secondly, because it had failed in its section five consultation obligation, because it didn't provide any costs information to the public when it went out to consultation, and therefore the public couldn't provide any informed response to the consultation. Um, so can I take the Lordships to section 2 and 5 of the 2009 measure? In other words, it's behind tab 6 in the authorities bundle. that a Welsh Improvement Authority must make arrangements to secure continuous improvement in the exercise of its function. In discharging its duty under subsection 1, an authority must have regard in particular to the need to improve the exercise of its functions in terms of, and then your worships will see a number of criteria, or aspects as I think they're called uh, sometimes, and, and a little f, efficiency. Now, and then section 5, mm -hmm. a few pages further on. Uh, for the purpose of de deciding how to fulfil the duties under section 2.1 and 3.1, I'll come back to 3.1 a little later, a Welsh Improvement Authority must consult and then little c, representatives of persons who use or are likely to use services provided by the authority. Now, um, obviously this submission assumes that those obligations apply to the decision, in this case, to adopt the strategy, and in particular the decision to provide the um, four strategic leisure centres. Uh, and that was common ground. Um, in the, at the hearing below, um, as we see, if you're I'm sorry, we'll go back to the documents bundle uh, and to um, uh, Mr. Gowdy's junior skeleton argument below, yeah. behind tab nine. Yeah, hmm? tab nine. Not, not my junior. The then council. The then council for the authority. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I stand corrected. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, so, Page. on tab 9, in order at, um, uh, at page 89, yeah. um, paragraph 23, CB, CCBC, that's the, the council, accepts that the general duty of improvement found in the 2009 measure can relate, amongst an improvement authority's other functions, to the discretionary function of the provision of leisure services. And then 26, CCBC accepts that the general duty of improvement set out in the 2009 measure is not specifically averred to in the strategy or in the report to the Cabinet. However, the question for the Court will be whether or not CCBC has complied with the duty as a matter of substance. So, as I say, both parties agreed that the general improvement duty under section 2 apply to this decision, but the judge of his own volition um, uh, took the point as to whether or not it really did, uh, and he held that it didn't. And as, as we understand his reasoning, he did so on the following basis. First of all, if you're 
Gorgias will go back to his judgment and go first to page 63. part of paragraph 20 which begins at the foot of the previous page uh, and um, about six lines down from the top of page 63 the judge says this this suggests that the section requires relevant authorities to put in place freestanding measures to improve decision making processes by reference to the criteria listed at section 2.2 of the 2009 measure so, stage one in his reasoning, we understand, is that that's what section two required, that's to say relevant authorities only to put in place freestanding measures to improve their decision-making processes. Secondly, if I can ask your lordships to go on to paragraph 24, at page 65, about six lines, five or six lines in, rather, given the way in which the duty is formulated, the issue must be whether the decision taken was by its nature a decision on the arrangements to be made by the authority to secure improvement in the exercise of its functions. Uh, and having articulated what he decided was the, the issue, at paragraph 26, um, he says that the sports strategy was in the nature of a plan for the future exercise of functions under section 19 of the 1976 Act. Uh, uh, I, I pause to note that he seems to have adopted section 19 of the no, I'm so sorry, it's section 19 of the... 1976 Act. Yes, in other words, what, what, both, what both parties had agreed below was the source of the function being um, uh, exercised in this case. That takes me back to the short point I made earlier really about whether the function arose... Well, under perhaps the judge's point. emphasis there is on the word future. Yes, it, it is, yes. The future exercise of function under section 19 of the, of the 76 Act, that decision is qualitatively different to the contracting out decision in Nash. The strategy decision was not in the nature of an arrangement to secure continuous improvement in the exercise of functions. It was a strategy for the steps the council wanted to take in respect of its provision of recreational facilities. Um, and so, paragraph 27, he concluded that the proposal to adopt the sport strategy was not an arrangement falling within the scope of section 2.1 of the 2009 measure and therefore there was no duty to consult under section 5.1. Um, we, we submit, as, as indeed did um, the council below, that section 2 applies to substantive decisions taken by a relevant authority such as the decision taken in the present case as to the provision of leisure centres over the next 10 years. And we submit that that uh, interpretation uh, is clear from the statutory provisions themselves. Um, can I ask you to go back to the 2009 measure? We may still have it open. Shown your lordships section two, which sets out a number of criteria. Can, can you help us speak for myself? I find the section two one quite bemusing. Um, as to what making arrangements to secure continuous improvement in the exercise of its functions. Well, your lordship is not alone in that, because Lord Justice Underhill had a similar difficulty in, in the Nash yeah. case, as, as, we'll, as we'll see. Um, uh, I mean, we... I mean, it doesn't... I mean, it would appear 
from section three, which I think you're going to show us, yes. that, it, that it, it's a general duty which is, uh, goes beyond um, setting itself improvement objectives. It is, because Section 3 provides for a separate duty yeah. for each financial, each year, financial year. A Welsh Improvement Authority must set itself objectives for improving the exercise of its functions during that year. So that's, that duty, we say, is, is, is separate from the duty in Section 2. Um, yeah, in, our, in our skeleton, we, we, we say, well, um, if your lordships take the view that, that um, the the meaning of making arrangements to secure is, to put it uh, at its lowest, ambiguous or difficult to discern, then one can look at the, at the guidance, the statutory guidance, which, which I will show your lordships in a moment. But our, our prior submission is that, that if you look not just at um, uh, uh, section two, but then at section four, mm. the meaning becomes rather clearer. Um, Section 4.2, a Welsh Improvement Authority improves the exercise of its functions in terms of, and then you see the, the six, one, two, three, seven, the seven criteria identified in Section 2.2, 2, uh, each, as it were, explained. So we see, if we take um, little b, service quality, if there is an improvement in the quality of services. Uh, uh, little c, service availability, if there is an improvement in the availability of services. And then, for present purposes, particularly relevant for present purposes, little f, efficiency, if there is an improvement in the efficiency with which resources are used in the provision of services or in the way in which functions are otherwise exercised. And what we say is, um, if you go back, for example, to, to little b, service quality, um, so the, the authority will improve the exercise of its functions in terms of service quality if there is an improvement in the quality of services. Um, that, that is to be distinguished from what the, uh, for how the judge interpreted the Section 2 duty, which was um, uh, rest restricted, he said, to an improvement in the internal decision-making processes of the authority. But that, we, we submit, is plainly not what uh, 4.2b is addressed to. 4.2b is addressed to an actual improvement in the quality of services. And, and thus it's addressed to, the, um, to, to substantive decisions taken by the relevant authority. Uh, and, and that applies, we say the same applies under little f, efficiency. If there's an improvement in the efficiency with which resources are used in the provision of service or in the way in which functions are otherwise exercised. Again, that, that couldn't be further from uh, an improvement in the internal decision-making processes of the authority. But the duty isn't to improve. No, it's, to make so arrangements. it's to make arrangements to secure. Doesn't that suggest it's once removed? In both section two and section three, the duty is to make arrangements to secure. No, I, 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 I accept that. Maybe that is what the judge was really alighting on when he well, concluded that. Well, three, three, section three clearly is, I mean, if one, and the judge refers to relies on section three, doesn't he? As one he, of the other sections. Yes, he did. This is a freestanding obligation. Yes, he, 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 yes. Section three clearly must be. Uh, freestanding, mustn't it? Because it's saying in every financial year, the authority must set itself objectives. So it's, it's focusing on at the beginning of the financial year, setting particular objectives independently of what it then goes on to actually do in, in terms of exercise of its functions. It doesn't follow from that that section two is freestanding, but as my Lord says, that the use of the words uh, set, the, um, Making arrangements to secure continuous improvement suggests, as, as my lord put to yes. you, that it's at one remove, and therefore the judge may be right in saying it's a freestanding 
Well, um, and, we, uh, and we, we submit that, it, that, that the Section 2 duty is freestanding from Section 3. Oh, well, well, yeah, that point I follow. Yes. But, but Section 3 2, to be fair, echoes the wording of, of Section 2 1. Yes, it does. Yeah. The authority must get, make arrangements yes. to secure the achievement of its improvement objectives. And, and, and if, if, if. Which is IE 3 1. Yes. And so you set them that you set, if you look at 3 1, you, you set, set objectives at the beginning of the financial year. Yes. And then and 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 you make arrangements to secure that those objectives will be achieved. Yeah. All of which seems to be independent of what you then go on actually do in terms of substantive functions. Yes, um, your, uh, your lordship may be suggesting that that um, the way it works is that the authority sets its improvement objectives for a financial year, mm. uh, and then, as it were, one turns to the freestanding section two duty. Um, which um, uh, in some way uh, obli then obliges the authority to, to carry out those objectives. Mm. Um, nor that's not how we would submit that the, um, the measure works. We, the, as the judge explained in his judgment, and I'll come to it in a moment, um, there is a separate enforcement framework built into the measure to enforce the enforce compliance with a Section 3 improvement objective duty. Section, uh, and, and to that extent, Section 3 might be thought of as something of a target duty because, um, one, because it would appear to be that, the, that um, Parliament decided to, to create this, uh, uh, this internal uh, enforcement framework rather than to make Section 3 justiciable in the ordinary way. But Section 2, as the judge accepted, is justiciable. And we submit that the two are separate and that, that the um, Section 2 duty applies um, uh, concurrently with, but at the end of the day, separately from the Section 3 duty. I, I think that's a sort of answer to your last question. Um, well, given the, how pollutedly clear the drafting of the legislation is... <laughs> But what, 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 what we can submit is that if one leaves aside what the judge said about the internal decision-making processes of the authority, and, and we submit that, 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 that the duty's got nothing to do with them, or at least if it does, it's, it's not just to do with them, it's, mm. it's to do with a lot more than those internal decision-making processes, that the, we, we do submit that this strategy and the decision on page 183 that did amount to arrangements to secure continuous improvement in the exercise of the of the local authorities' functions. In this case, it's functions of providing leisure services. So on that basis alone, we, we submit that the Section 2 duty plainly applied. Now, if um, your lordship's um, uh, do not accept that submission, uh, and if your lordships take the view that the um, the duty under section two is is ambiguous, um, then we submit that your lordships are plainly entitled to. Um, uh, look at the relevant guidance, which is of persuasive, but no more than persuasive uh, authority or persuasive as assistance to the meaning to be given to legislative pro provisions. Yeah. But um, um, and, and there are one or two authorities in the bundle that support what we submit is a pretty well-established principle of statutory interpretation in any event. So I wasn't proposing to take lordships to them unless it becomes necessary to do so, perhaps, in, in reply. No, if it's ambiguous. And um, but it, but, but our, our first, our primary submission is that, is that um, the strategy comes within the Section 2 in any event. Um, yeah. Could you just on that help 
this is how this strategy comprises arrangements to make to secure well, the sorry, arrangements to secure continuous improvement well, efficiency. Well, well, we would say, for example, by um, uh, the decision to provide only four strategic plans, uh, strategic um, centres, um, the um, upshot of which, as we understand the um, strategy, would be to, although it would rationalise the provision of le leisure centres, because those would be four state-of-the-art leisure centres to which everyone would be able to gain access, um, they, that would improve um, the provision of leisure services. And I don't understand the council to suggest otherwise. Is that not arguably uh, falling under section four, which is an aspect of improvement uh, as opposed to an arrangement to secure reading the strategy clearly it was aimed at improving efficiency by taking 10 leisure centres and crunching them down to four. Can that be regarded as an arrangement to secure continuous improvement or just improvement? But, but that I think is the, what the judge was really yes. thinking about. Um, well, your Lordship has, has our submission. If, if we're wrong about that, then, then we submit that, that, the, um, uh, that the section, although it um, uh, applies to um, the decision-making processes that would um, precede any such decision, it, it also applies to the substantive decision itself can I therefore just show you a well, that's, that's the point, though, isn't it? That, that uh, in trying to make sense of all this, mm. which isn't easy, um, there's a general duty to, to, to in relation to improvement. Yes. Uh, and if, if the judge is addressing the submission that that general duty it covers this strategy, yes, uh, which is otherwise setting out of um, whether it's setting stone or, or uh, you know a firm decision as you would submit in relation to grounds one and two whether it's aspirational it's dealing with what what the authority is actually going to do in terms of, in, of improving its services the, the the if that if that's as it were is, is within section two is an arrangement within section two then there's an obligation to consult under section five that's what it comes to, yeah, isn't correct. it? Correct. So, in one sense, what where one gets to is that where, wherever the where, wherever and whenever the council is is actually carrying out it, its obligations under section four, for example, yes, it ends up in a situation where that's a, an arrangement under section two, and therefore there's a duty to consult. Yes, I. I in, like, every, in every in case. every single well, no case. no only this is what we get from Nash, which I'll show you in a moment. Only in high level, only in the case of high level decisions, right. because because as Lord Justice Unhill explained, I think in Nash, it, it simply wouldn't be feasible to apply this duty to every decision right. um, taken by. Well, that's what, uh, that, yeah. So okay. he yeah. held that, uh, that, that, the, that the duty only applies to high level decisions, uh, and we would say that this. Uh, strategy obviously falls into that category, and and I, I feel I I'm, I may not have answered fully enough my Lord Justice Haddon Cave's previous question. Um, we say that um, uh, this, this strategy um, purported to uh, be an arrangement to secure improvement in the exercise of its functions, um, specifically in relation to efficiency, but but the underlying submission we make under the on the third ground is that um, without the council ha 
having any information as to the consequences of the decision, then it couldn't possibly uh, comply with its uh, Section 2, 2F duty, uh, particularly when you go back to Section 4 and the explanation as to what efficiency means in this context. That is to say, if there is an improvement in the efficiency with which resources are used in the provision of services or in the way in which functions are otherwise exercised, and without any costs, any information as to likely costs, uh, the Cabinet couldn't begin to uh, uh, decide whether it was complying with the improvement. If you say your ground two feeds into it does. ground three. That's right. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think I ought to just to show you, Lordships, the, the relevant passages from the um, from the guidance, just so that you have yeah. them in mind if if you get to the point of. Um, Of looking for where is that? It's behind tab 16 in the model authorities. This is in some space hardly more pellucid. No, I, I, Lord. <laughs> mm. Yes, I agree. But um, mm. uh, I have only a few passages to, to really? show you. Yeah. Um, internal page 6. First bullet point, improvement properly means more than just quantifiable gains in service output or efficiency or in the internal effectiveness of authorities. And, and we show you that, that because of what the judge said about um, the duty being restricted to um, the internal decision-making processes of the authority. Um, and then uh, 2.2 sets out what you've seen already in the... 2.3. 2.2 sets out, set out what you've already seen in section 4. Um, can I then go to 3.2, which is on page 9? to improvement in the context of the 2009 measure means more than just <coughs> quantifiable gains in the service out. No. Sorry, 3.2, my lord. Yeah, but it's exactly the same as the one before, 2.1. Well, the same as 2.1. It, it is, yes. It's identical it, wording, pretty it, it much. It is. I think 2.1 was the sort of overview, and this is yeah. 3.2, which repeats it. Yes. Yeah. 3.10, page 11. Thus, it follows that for an authority to successfully discharge its general duty, it should incorporate the seven aspects of improvement into all of its decision-making processes and its assessments of functions and services. And as we point out in our scale of knowledge, that the strategy was not only a decision-making process, but also an assessment of the council's leisure services. And then finally, internal numbering, page 26. Paragraph 6.1. Um, one of the overarching principles of this revision of the Wales Programme for Improvement is that improvement must be grounded in the actual needs of an area and its citizens, not the internal workings of an authority. Well, that's the clearest you, um, provision you have that contradicts what the judge says. Correct. Um, now, we also say, since your lordships, your lordships have the authorities bundle still open, um, that uh, the decision of Lord Justice Underhill, at first instance in Nash, supports our mm. interpretation. It's behind tab 12, as I said.
And the case, so far as it's relevant to, to, to the present appeal, um, as we see from paragraph 61, although the report isn't paginated, I'm afraid. Concerned a provision of the Local Government and Public Involvement in Health Act 2007, um, section 3, which um, uh, was not dissimilar to the present statute, although it concerned a, base, a best value duty, but the language is, is, is not dissimilar. So one, a best value authority must make arrangements to secure a continuous improvement in the way in which its functions are exercised, having regard to a combination of economy, efficiency, and effectiveness. And then, if your lordships would go on, please, to uh, paragraph 68, a few pages further on. It's slightly different, isn't it? Because it says, in the way in which its functions are exercised, whereas our section 2 says continuous improvement in the exercise. Correct. And, and um, one, one needs to read that slight difference of... of um, Which helps you in the sense. It, it does, yes. And I, well, so I submit. <laughs> um, so, but one needs to, as it were, read that into what the judge says in paragraph 69 when he comes to analyse that... Um, Although if the legislature intended the two sections to have different meanings, it would have been helpful if they'd spelled it out a bit more. I agree. Um, Has anybody looked at the travel for, for, for the Act, for the travel repertoire, to see what intention? Of, of the 2009 measure? No, we oh, saw, but we did not find the Lord. Um, it is, of course, a Welsh measure, and therefore, whereas the best value duty, we're talking about the UK legislature, the Welsh measure is a measure of the Welsh Assembly. Uh, they're now Welsh Acts, but it was Welsh measures in 2009. So it's a different Indeed. legislature. But you, you lost and you couldn't find... We haven't found anything that, uh, that assists. And the guidance, of course, is months after the legislation was enacted. Yeah. Uh, yes, although th this was the... Uh, this, this, this is the guidance... Um, this is not later guidance. This is the, uh, the, the contemporaneous, as contemporaneous as can be guidance. Um, I give it to you, 2010, if I recall. Yeah, right. Yes, well, some mm. assemblies of... Well, I'll say that. So, um, section three actually is set out at, um, in paragraph 60... Yes, sir, we, I've just looked at it. So, paragraph 68. 60. I'm sorry, well, I... I, I I've taken you to what Section 3 says already, um, so I don't need, need yeah. to, to do that again. So, paragraph 68. Against that background, I turn to consider the language of subsections 1 and 2. Um, I, start to the, I start with subsection 1. Um, the core subject matter is the way in which the authorities' functions are exercised. That, that, that is very general language. It could, in a different context, cover almost any choice about anything that the authority does, but in this context it seems to me clear that it connotes high level choices about how, as a matter of principle and approach, an authority goes about performing its functions. Um, but then I don't think I need to trouble you with well, two, the duty is aimed at securing improvements in the way in which the authority's functions are exercised. And then three, the actual duty is not formulated as a duty to secure improvements simpliciter but as a duty to make arrangements to do so. Not sure why this formula was adopted. I do not think that the draftsman was concerned with administrative arrangements. It may have been thought that to impose a duty simply to secure improvements would expose authorities to legal challenges from those who contended that particular decisions were for the worse or that authorities were wrong in failing to take particular steps, which it was asserted would make things better. The reference to making arrangements would make it clear that the duty was concerned with intentions rather than outcome. It may also be that the draftsman wanted to emphasise the need to build the fulfilment of the best value duty into authorities' plans and procedures, or perhaps it is just circumlution, 
But whatever the explanation, the important point for present purposes is, that, is what the arrangements are aimed at, namely securing improvements in the way in which authorities perform their functions or to read across to the 2000 and measure, securing improvements in the exercise of this authority's functions. So we submit that that too supports um, what we say about the judge's interpretation of the duty, in particular his restriction of it to the internal decision-making processes of the authority. And, and, and it was, was this right, a substantive decision with which this case was concerned, namely to outsource the relevant provision. Yes. As, as distinct from um, a dis decision about how we are going to decide whether to outsource. You see what I mean? Well, so it's as, 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 in other words, not to do with the decision making process, yeah, but, no, but with yes. the question do we, do we outsource or not? Well, that's right, it was. Yeah, and you, 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 in, in a sense, what the judge, I mean, of course, they are not identical pieces of legislation, but as you rightly say, there is a distinct similarity. The judge's analysis, at least at 20, in, in terms of a freestanding measure, does seem to be inconsistent with Lord Justice Underhill's analysis of paragraph 69, sub paragraph 3, to the effect that um, whatever else it is, it's not simply administrative arrangements, because those, those would be an example of a freestanding measure, wouldn't they? Well, that, that's what we said. Yes. Right. But I think what's said against you is that when the judge gets on to deal with Nash in paragraph 24 of his judgment, he appears, appears to have taken a slightly different view as to what, what, what it was that he was um, or as, as, if you like, as the target, doesn't he? Well, that, that's where he says that the, um, was the decision taken by its nature a decision on the arrangements yes. being made by the authorities? And, and, and well, that, that I think takes us back to the the overarching question in this case, which is was the strategy simply a policy, the setting of a policy objective, mm. or did it involve at least one firm decision, the, the one at page one eight three? And, and, I, and it, it, would, it would seem to us with respect that that's, that's what the judge had in mind at, at that, at, in paragraph 24 at that point. So that key question, in a sense, applies to all three of the grounds of appeal. <coughs> Do we get anything from the Court of Appeal in that? Lord, um, they, um, they were concerned, I think, only with the question of time. Um, but they, there's nothing in the Court of Appeal. Well, it wasn't suggested, it wasn't argued as a, as a ground of appeal that the judge, or Justice Underhill, was, his decision was wrong um, in, on the issue that we're looking at. But I would, um, the, the judge also, if I can take it all just back to his judgment, um, relied upon. Although the, I see that um, Lord Justice Davis does use at paragraph 65 um, the language of substantive or final decisions. In other words, he treats the decision to um, uh, uh, outsource or to um, invite tenders from prospective people yeah. to whom they could be outsourced. Mm -hmm. And he says those decisions are properly to be regarded as substantive or, if you like, final. Yes, and it shows sure. on not to be regarded as contingent or provisional. Yes, I, mean, that, I appreciate that's to do with the timing question, yeah. whether the um, time started to run for the purpose of bringing judicial review, yeah. but it um, may, may be a relevant use of language. Lord, we, 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 we say it is, and we say it supports our interpretation. I think, I think we may have referred to that um, in our skeleton. That passage in our skeleton. The judge also um, referred to some of the other sections 
of the 2009 measure um, in um, paragraph 20 of his judgment. So if, if we can go back to that paragraph. Um, we're about uh, on page 63, I'm sorry, on page 63, about 10 lines from the top of the page. He says this conclusion, that's his, his conclusion about um, the Section 2 duty, is reinforced by the obligation of Section 3 for relevant authorities each year to set improvement objectives in respect of the exercise of their functions. The obligation of Section 13 to make arrangements to collect information to permit assessment of whether um, uh, the improvement objectives have been met. Provisions at Section 18 for the Auditor General for Wales to assess the compliance of each relevant authority with the requirements of Part 1 of the 2009 measure, including Section 2, and the power in Section 21 to carry out inspections of a relevant authority's compliance with the Part 1 obligations. Together, taken together, these provisions are a pragmatic framework for, for assessing compliance with a Section 2 improvement duty. But um, Section 3 is, of course, as we've, as we've seen, a separate um, uh, uh, obligation to the Section 2 duty. Uh, and so Section 13, the um, obligation to make arrangements to collect information to permit assessment of whether the improvement objectives have been met, that, that, that set, that, that's part of a, obviously a separate regime for seeking to um, enforce, self-enforce first. Well, the, that, I think maybe what the judge had in mind is um, not you, you're absolutely right about that but I think his point is, is this and it's a point my Lord Lord Justice Haddon Cave put to you it's the making arrangements for here the collection of information which obviously is something different from the actual collection of the information yes, yes. so it, well, it's talking about a framework setting up a framework setting up a system which will then be implemented yes and then, so the judge's point about section two is it, it's about setting up a system that will then be implemented yes. in the future. Yes. Well, well in that case, I, I'm not going to trouble you with those other sections. Um, uh, in other words, where, where does that, all that leave us? Yeah, sorry, Mr. That's quite all right. Um, Lord, if we're, if we're right about our interpretation of the Section 2 duty, then the judge acknowledged that um, <coughs> uh, uh, the obligation, the, the submissions under um, mm -hmm. the, the duty, let's say the failures to <coughs> comply with the duty, I'm looking at the, the opening words of paragraph 20, foot of page 62, that those arguments would clearly have force, which gets us off to some sort of a reasonable start. Um, and we submit that he's obviously right about that because um, uh, the, and this is the overlap, I've made the point already, where the, point, the earlier points feed into this, to this um, uh, uh, argument that there was a failure therefore on the part of the uh, council to uh, carry out its improvement duty under section two because it didn't have any cost information available to it to enable it to decide whether it was complying with that duty or not. And secondly, as to the section five duty, um, because it didn't have any such obligations, any such information, um, it was unable to provide the uh, proper consultation uh, to the representatives of the service users to enable them to respond to the consultation exercise. I, I'm struggling to understand the extent of the overlap. What, what are the circumstances in which, hypothetically, you would lose on ground two 
because of the nature of the strategy document being as the judge described it, but nevertheless win on ground three because um, it ought to have had financial consequences spelled out. No, I, I, I think because <coughs> ground three, the, the measure makes specific, specific provision for um, uh, an improvement duty uh, which must have regard to the efficiency of the functions being performed. In this case, the efficiency <coughs> of the leisure services being provided. Uh, and in order to decide whether, in taking the decision in November 2018, the authority was complying with that duty, it had to have the financial information that I've described to your lordships available in order to decide whether that duty was being complied with as a result of the strategy which he was being asked to adopt and the specific decision on page 183, particularly because of what the description uh, in section 4 of the measure says about resources, resources exactly. I suppose it could be said after the, with the more the strategy document is just a strategy document rather than a decision document, the more it could be said to fall within section two because it's therefore more about making arrangements to secure continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. So if you lose on the decision yes. point, yes. it may actually strengthen you yes. on ground three, because we're further away from section four, which is improving, actually making decisions to improve, but you're um, making arrangements by having a decent strategy, which has all these words like sustainability and so on. Well, Lord, I, that, that, I confess wasn't a point that occurred to either of us, but I, I entirely accept your Lordship's point and Gratefully adopted. Um, <laughs> I don't think I can put it any other way. Um, um, Lords, unless I can assist your lordships further, those are our submissions. Thank you very much, Mr. Yes, Mr. Gowdy. My lords, uh, <coughs> ground of appeal one. Uh, and ground two, and to some extent ground three, uh, the key question of the nature of the strategy. Uh, and in the light of the uh, exchange between my Lord, Lord Justice Haddon Cave and my learned friend at the close of his submissions, I have every intention of having my cake and eat it, uh, so far as that is concerned. But Lord, the nature of the strategy um, is the key question. And quite simply, in our submission, the substance of the strategy is that it is a strategy. It is no less than a strategy, a genuinely strategy document, as the learned judge put it. It's no more than a strategy, a de demonstration of intent. It's aspirational, a policy objective, as the judge aptly put it, not a hard-edged route map. It's tentative, not set in stone. And it applies, as your Lordships know, over a number of years, indeed an entire decade, and there is correspondingly an extended implementation period of 10 years, 10 or so financial years and 10 or thereabouts annual budgets. Mm. The strategy is not itself a firm decision on any particular facility, Indeed, it's not a decision at all, other, of course, than a decision to adopt a strategy. The strategy is the context for numerous later and much later specific decisions in circumstances as they will by then be prevailing. Page 183, my lord, um, the key page in the strategy, if we can just go back for a moment, and in particular little b, uh, 
a rationalization of facilities will result in four strategic high quality multi service leisure centers that are the four strategic centers will be located and the locations are spelt out. It then continues, it is therefore anticipated, anticipated that other leisure centers would either transfer to school management uh, or could, could close completely. Careful consideration will be given to opportunities for alternative provision before, before any facilities are withdrawn. So it's expressed in terms of what is anticipated and what could happen, and it is prescriptive only in that it says that consideration will be given. Where's the careful consideration point? I'm not, I'm not reading that at the moment. Lord, um, it's the last sentence of B. The word careful appears at the end of the penultimate line which then continues, careful consideration will be given to opportunities for alternative Maybe provision. Maybe my document is a different document. Mm. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Page 183. Page 183. And 33 in the... Little b. Yes. I seem to have a version of the um, strategy that doesn't have that last sentence. Oh, dear. I don't so, know why. So oh, why. Yeah. Yes. And I actually, we were invited to, to take out what was originally in the bundle and put in this instead, but it's so maybe that we've been invited to put, put in Lord has, an earlier Lord version. has indicated it's page 33. It is the, page 33 Mr. of the original document. Page 33, it's a different version. Lord Dust has had in case got the same problem. No. Uh, has somebody got page 33 in, in its final version? I think it's very helpful. A number of copies that may even be in glorious Because I, I, okay. yeah, I didn't, I didn't um, comply with the instruction to change it over, but the version I was given doesn't have that sentence, although the one originally in the bundle, which is still there, does. Yes, I, I've been going on the one that was originally in the bundle, which was replaced, as I understood it, because it wasn't a good copy and the left-hand margin was left out, and therefore... Um, well, what that suggests is that there were, there were two versions. We better be careful that they're working off the right version. Yes. We don't want to be too aspirational about this. Because <laughs> on one view, it remains a pretty awful copy, as, for example, page 185 demonstrates. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, well, well, we I'm, do. I'm, told, I'm told that the original document was the correct version, and mistakenly the, the version to be substituted was the draft version, not the correct document. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I mean, it's, it's Lord Justice said, it's law of documents, I'm afraid, in action. At some point, if, if Lord Justice Hayden came and I could be given the right page 33, <laughs> I'm helpful. I'm <laughs> grateful to what my learned friend has just said, my Lord, and of course... Well, it may, it may make it? some considerable difference, actually. Well, my Lord, I certainly make a submission on the basis of that last sentence mm. in the authentic version, uh, namely that the strategy is prescriptive, only it's in that it says that consideration will be given uh, to opportunities for alternative provision before any facility is withdrawn. So, my Lord, it's emphatically well short of a decision actually to withdraw any facility, or for that matter, to make £550,000 investment uh, in Newbridge, uh, as was decided by a later decision uh, in April of 2019. And my Lord, manifestly relevant factors will be taken into account in officers' reports and by members as the process progresses over the decade and at each and every stage of the process in the light of the current circumstances, including obviously changing cost circumstances, detailed financial implications, availability of funding, which local authorities have scant knowledge of uh, beyond a single year, approval of business case, etc. As the officer duly pointed out in his report, in the passage cited by Mr Justice Swift at paragraphs 11 and 15 of his judgment. Well, you, you, I see the force of that in, in, in relation to budgets for future years. And if, if, if what we were talking about is... 
in relation to these four strategic centres is either a new build or a substantial renovation. That's going to cost money, which may or may, may or may not be available in two years' time or three years' time. Yes, you indeed. The council may find it's just in a position where it can't afford to do anything at all. Indeed. And indeed, the strategy might remain un unimplemented because it could never be afforded. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, obviously, changing circumstances will apply. And of course, if one had uh, some decisions in year one, uh, then when it came to make a decision um, uh, in year one, obviously the question was it a matter for, was that decision a matter for cabinet as the executive or was it a matter for full council, uh, would be an issue that would be capable of being arising by reference to that budget. Mm -hmm. But if per contra one was in year three or in year seven or whenever or in most of the years of the decade, that a decision is being made, then it uh, would um, have to would not be solely a matter for the executive if any question arose of it not being compatible with that year's budget or capital plan or uh, so. Whatever. So the question of um, cabinet or full authority will, in practice, depend on what goes into the budget at the beginning of each year. Yes. And nobody knows which, what's going to go into future budgets, obviously. Uh, not least because um, uh, questions of government grant, for example, and so forth, are liable to, to change, usually in the wrong direction. I mean, hence, to what to some extent well, drives the adoption of this particular direction. strategy. Well, you might have floods which would lead to particular expenditure, mm. which means you have to cut back on other areas. Indeed. So you... Your point is that in each financial year, the crystallising moment when the, deci the actual decision is made is when budget sums are allocated to that particular project. Indeed. Year on year. Yes. And the Lord, uh, one can make perhaps the same point in another way, in, and that is that the adoption of the strategy as a strategy does not itself have cost consequences. It neither mandates nor even authorises any expenditure. It neither mandates nor authorises any saving. It neither mandates nor authorises any investment. It neither mandates nor authorises the realisation of any capital receipt. It does not procure any contract. It does nothing save, importantly in itself, set apart at a high level of generality, the adoption of the strategy does not have any legal consequence at all, still less an obvious legal consequence for any individual leisure facility. I mean, a highly pertinent example of this point arises in relation to the later and separate closure proposal uh, and decision in relation to the particular facility with which Mr Williams is, is concerned. And my Lord, there are six brief points about that uh, later, a few months in this case, uh, but later nonetheless, uh, points about that proposal. First, uh, and obviously, the Council recognised that it required a further decision. It obviously could not say, and did not say, that the closure was already covered by the adoption of the strategy. Consistency with the strategy was way short of being enough. Secondly, the council had to get that later decision right in accordance with all legal principles. Again, it could not say, and did not say, that the decision was determined by the strategy, or that its discretion was in any way or to any extent fettered. Third, it did get that later decision wrong on the public sector equality duty and its decision was quashed by Mr Justice Swift on that basis. Lord, the later decision was, in other words, a very real decision, not the mere rubber stamping 
of an earlier decision or anything like that. Fourth, that particular later decision and any other later closure decision is potentially open to challenge on any, on any or all of the usual bases, including the public sector equality duty again, uh, failure to take account of relevant considerations and or irrationality and, and so forth. In, in other in, words... Including if um, Ms. Tavis is otherwise right on um, what he says about the schedule for the measure, that it was taken by the Cabinet and should have been by the, executive, by the full authority. Indeed, my Lord. That would arise at that stage in relation to that decision. Yeah. So, my Lord, in other words, matters pertaining to one particular centre are irrelevant to this appeal, which is concerned only with the county borough-wide 10-year strategy. Fifth, by contrast with the strategy adoption with which we are concerned, uh, and with no financial implications at that stage, when it comes to an individual decision, financial implications, including but not confined to cost, are obviously an important element. And if one looks in the uh, documentation before your lordships um, at the uh, papers in relation to uh, the later decisions, uh, one sees that they have sections on financial implications and costs uh, and uh, so forth. Uh, sixth, when months after the adoption of the strategy in November 2018, uh, the specific closure decision was taken in April 2019, the approach adopted towards the strategy was very properly to have regard to its broad purpose and direction, to its key principles and vision. And that's apparent indeed uh, from the April uh, 2019 uh, minutes. Um, so... Uh, Where does one get that? The Lord one gets that, that. Um, at uh, tab, tab 19. 19. Tab 20 is the... Uh, no, that's Newbridge. Um, no, so tab sorry, 21, the minute. Tab 21, sorry. Yeah. Tab 21. This is um, Cabinet on the 10th of April of 2019. It's item 9 that we're concerned with. That's at page 261. Mm. Um, and the third paragraph from the bottom, the Cabinet Minute Member for Neighbourhood Services highlighted that the Council's strategy outlines the future purpose and direction for the provision of sport and active recreation in Carefilly County Borough and establishes the key principles and vision which will inform future decisions and actions. That, with respect, puts it rather well. Um, and so um, uh, that um, uh, is entirely consistent uh, with a correct approach in that respect um, at the later stage. Um, based on what the strategy did and what it did not do. Uh, and um, your Lordships will have seen in paragraph 30 of our learned friend Skeleton as the bold and bold assertion that the substance of the decision, the strategy adoption decision made on the 14th of November 2018, was that the leisure centre, i.e. the leisure centre, uh, around which this particular case initially resort, revolved, uh, would close. Would close. And that, with respect, my lords, is nonsense on at least two scores. First, the substance of the strategy was, of course, all future le leisure provision, uh, retained or new, not any one particular existing facility. It was what it said on the tin. It was a general 10-year strategy, borough-wide. Second, the council was candid that amongst other developments, the particular facility might close, but there is nothing to the effect 
nothing to the effect that it would close. And of course, there is a gulf of difference between might and would. That is a fundamental distinction. And the failure to recognize that distinction for what it is, uh, is amongst the fundamental flaws in the appellant's case. Would you accept that it was at least looking very likely that the council would take a future decision to close this particular centre, given the, given the history that it had already set that process uh, in train, and then um, deferred a decision pending strategy, and the strategy we know um, supported that proposal, and indeed the um, report to the council said that not to close would, would undermine, undermine the strategy. strategy. Yeah, so, it was looking, so it was looking pretty grim for um, this leisure centre once the strategy was adopted, wasn't it? Lord, I wouldn't accept that it goes as far as being pretty grim without the benefit of hindsight. Um, but well, Lord, I think one yes. has to be realistic about this, Mr. Lord, Mr. being realistic. So November the 21st until uh, some date in uh, the 10th yeah. of April. Um, as my Lord puts to you, you know, the writing was on the wall. Well, my Lord, That's another way of putting the same I point. would accept that the writing was on the wall. I would accept that it was on the cards. I would accept that it was more likely than not that that would happen. Mm. But it wasn't going to happen without a further decision, and it wasn't well, necessarily going to happen at all. Well, that, that's probably a, a better point. And, uh, and, and indeed, if it did, it might or might not happen only a few months later uh, or a few years later. Uh, there were many uncertainties which would be resolved by later decisions, whether quite soon later or very much later, and were not resolved uh, by the strategy itself. Uh, whatever um, indications that may, might give as to what the course of future history was uh, likely to prove to be. Um, but one can see how, from one point of view, uh, a degree of uh, pessimism uh, as to future developments um, uh, might be uh, the case. Um, but that would be a, a, an apprehension in relation to what future decisions might very well be. Uh, I accept no less than that, but I emphatically urge not more than that either. Um, and the same point can be made by reference to the officer's report to the meeting of Cabinet on the 8th of November that adopted the strategy. Of course, it's that decision, perhaps, rather than the strategy itself, which is the subject matter of the judicial review uh, and that's uh, a tab 17 mm -hmm. uh, beginning on um, uh, well that's the report to scrutiny committee but I think the same tab 18 isn't it? tab 18 um, it is the minutes of the 8th of November meeting um, but I think one sees um, at page, from page 186, particularly at page 190, um, that uh, paragraph 414, referring to the draft strategy at that stage. Um, Sorry, where, where are we? Well, Lord, page 190. Thank you. Uh, paragraph 4.14, uh, four lines in, this means that over the 10-year life of the strategy, the Council intends, so a statement of intention, to invest in four high-class strategic multifunctional activities, meaning that some other sites may close or be managed by others. Uh, during, and then there's a reference to a particular uh, consultation response in relation to a particular centre and then the council is acutely aware of concerns regarding any potential loss of facilities and will give careful consideration to opportunities for alternative provision before any facilities are withdrawn so the language of page 183 paragraph B 
Decisions on each will be subject to separate reports and a specific decision-making process as the authority evolves to the new model of provision over the lifetime of the strategy. And that, again, in our submission, um, uh, expresses the position succinctly and correctly. Uh, and um, the, the, this is the report, isn't it? This is the report, actually, to the scrutiny committee. The, the, few, the actual decision, the actual decision that is the subject of the judicial review, is the one in tab fifteen. That's the, the decision of the cabinet. Yes. On whether to adopt the draft strategy or not. Yes. Uh, and well, the relevant well, bits on page one hundred and forty-six. But that point, uh, or, or a, a similar point to the point you're making, emerges from the middle of page 147. I'm great from the Lord, yes. Yeah. Where there's a, a specific reference to the potential closure of this facility and another one. Yes. Uh, uh, and that and it then says, in terms of leisure centre provision, officers confirmed any proposals for closure of facilities will be subject to further reports, yes. which will be presented to members for consideration. Yes. The Lord, it was always and then, they, and then that um, resolution at one four nine that the um, the strategy be formally adopted. Yes, the Lord. So it was always totally clear if the strategy were adopted that there would be future reports and future decisions, mm. and that future decisions would be dependent on circumstances as they would be at the time of those future decisions. Mm including approval, availability of funding, the approval of a robust business case, and the question of um, addressing alternative uh, facilities as a mandatory uh, consideration. So, my lord, the adoption of the strategy had no cost consequences, was not out with the budget for the first or any of the ten financial years, and was a decision for Cabinet, uh, not for scrutiny, obviously, and not for full council. Uh, secondly, the costs uh, would be costs of implementation uh, down the line, not of initial adoption of the strategy. And third, the implementation costs down the line uh, were simply not a Wensbury manifestly relevant consideration at the time of the adoption of the strategy. It was not irrational not to have those costs at that time. Um, uh, and in any event, of course, as has already been observed, the costs of implementation over 10 years and where they might fall uh, would not and can, could not be known at the time of the adoption of the strategy. Uh, and the decision, quite simply, was for Cabinet, because as your Lordships have seen, that is the legislative default position, and that is not displaced by the uh, regulations. Can, can we just, um, looking, looking at the minutes of the actual meeting where the decision was made, page yeah. 149, the last page, um, the resolution is uh, resolved that for the reasons contained in the officer's report, can we just make sure that we've identified that? Correctly, which one is that? Yes, well, that's the resolution, and the officer's report is a little further on. Um, well, it must be the report that's referred to in the second paragraph on the six, uh, page one four six, isn't it? The head of public protection, community and leisure services, along with the sports and leisure facilities manager and sports and leisure development manager, presented the report. Yes, yes. I just want to make sure I know which it's document in the bubble that Hart is. Horn's witness statement. But uh, as to, with all these various reports, the, as your Lordship say, the operative one is the one that went to the 14th November. Cabinet meeting. Well, I think I, 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 like, like, like my Lord, I, I can't like to know which one that is. Because it's not entirely clear, is it? No. Um, I mean, is it the same report as went to the, the scrutiny committee? Well, we understand it. 
not least because no other report has been disclosed by the council. The document at um, tab 17, yeah. which was the report to the scrutiny committee. So it's the same yes. report. It's the same yeah. report as was put before the okay. cabinet. Right. And I say that because, not least because, no other report, no separate, different report has been produced. I mean, well, that's also my understanding. All right. Well, I thought it might be, but I wanted to make sure. Yes. Well, well, I think it must much. be right because there's a reference, isn't there, at page uh, 147 to paragraph 413 in the uh, Pond and Centre and Disclosure, and you pick that up on page 190. So it's the same report. Okay. Good, thank you. Lord, I think uh, that covers um, uh, ground one and therefore in part ground two. But in relation to, um, uh, well, let me just conclude on, on ground one. The decision to adopt the uh, strategy was simply a decision with concerned with sports and active recreation provision uh, and the discharge of a particular function, which the parties are agreed is section 19 of the 1976 Act, the function of the provision of recreational facilities. It was not a decision concerned with expenditure or borrowing in year one or in any of the succeeding nine financial years. And even if it were, it was not a decision that was inconsistent with any budget or financial plan for the current or any later uh, financial year. So, my lord, the, the second the ground of appeal so far is not already covered. Lord, in our submission, that is, the second ground of appeal is in reality a Wensbury reasonableness challenge, or it is nothing, and it is nothing. As the learned judge rightly put it in paragraph 17 of his judgment, the decision in question, the decision to adopt the strategy, did not commit the council to any specific expenditure the council did not then need to know the likely costs of future decisions that might or might not be made at some point in the following decade. Putting it another way, in terms of reasonableness, a multi-stage approach is eminently sensible and entirely lawful. And the strategy, as your Lordship has seen, uh, did uh, address efficiency um, and was concerned with an outcome, as one would expect of a strategy, uh, one of the key outcomes being to secure a more efficient and financially sustainable uh, future. Uh, and that appears at various points. So the appellant gets his bite of the cherry every time he or anyone else challenges any uh, closure uh, decision in relation to any facility, he's not entitled to a further bite in relation to a strategy which goes much wider than simply the one centre. Mm. And my Lord, uh, that takes me to the third ground of appeal, namely the 2009 Wales measure. Uh, my Lord, that of course is a matter of statutory interpretation on the materials that are admissible or for an exercise in a statutory interpretation. Lords, as with the other grounds, there is little that needs to be said beyond our submission that the judge was demonstrably right for the very reasons that he lucidly gave and that any phrase here or there that might be open to criticism uh, does not in any way detract uh, from the overall substance and correctness yeah. of his uh, reasoning. But Lord, the measure, 2009 uh, a measure, is about, as your Lordships know, making arrangements to secure continuous improvement in the exercise of functions generally. Uh, so it is about general improvement arrangements, not the discharge of specific functions. It's simply not the present case at all. Uh, that is why the required consultation, when the measure does apply, is with res representatives of residents generally and service users generally, not the users of a specific leisure centre, or not the users indeed of leisure centres specifically, 
still less the users of one particular uh, leisure centre. Uh, and that is also why the 2009 measure is concerned, amongst other matters, uh, with administrative arrangements. That's section 35.2 of the measure. In other words, back office arrangements. And my Lord, I don't suggest uh, that it's so confined, but that does give one a flavour of the sort of thing uh, that that is about. Um, my Lord, the measure, as your Lordship uh, know, is at tab um, uh, 6, I think it is. And 35 is. Page 34. I'm grateful. Page 34 of the internal print. Uh, and it's the interpretation uh, provision. Um, and it's subsection 2. For the purposes of this part, unless the context otherwise requires a reference to the exercise of a function by a Welsh Improvement Authority, such as the Council, includes a reference to the carrying out of connected act, such as the making of administrative arrangements. So that's part of it, uh, without being the whole of it. Mm. Now, my Lord, um, the appellant has produced uh, the guidance uh, which is at tab 16, as your Lordship has seen, uh, and also a number of authorities uh, relating to the matter of guidance. Um, and uh, they, of course, suggest that the guidance supports their interpretation of Section 2, in particular, of the 2009 measure. Well, we make two essential submissions in response to that. Um, First of all, uh, we submit that none of the authorities on which they rely uh, undermines the point we make in our skeleton. In fact, it supports our approach that the guidance is not an admissible aid to interpretation. But two, in any event, if one does look at the guidance, the passages from the guidance on which the appellant relies do not take them anywhere for present purposes. Uh, taking the two paragraphs most relied upon, uh, first, uh, paragraph 310 of the guidance, which your Lordships have recently seen, uh, uh, stating that an authority should incorporate the seven aspects of improvement into all of its decision-making processes and its assessments of functions and services. Um, and uh, the question of uh, whether Section 2 applies to all decision-making processes, well, Lord, that simply cannot be right, because if it did, uh, the 2009 measure uh, would impose, uh, in addition to any other duty to consult, uh, a duty to consult with all of the groups in Section 5 before any decision could ever be taken. And that must be far, far too reaching. Um, and secondly, what that's doing is, is you would say it's, it's, it's directing the authority that in making the arrangements, it has to ensure that it set up a system where the decisions that it actually makes subsequently um, take account of the seven aspects. Yes, because it refers to decision-making processes. Yes. Mm. Uh, in, uh, the seven uh, aspects, including B uh, and F. And my Lord, secondly, paragraph 6.1 of the guidance, yeah. um, uh, we agree it's not limited necessarily to the internal workings of authority. Uh, it could include, as for example in Nash, on the best value duty in England under Section 3 of the 1999 Local Government Act, uh, wholesale contracting out of functions, which is what Barnet Council was about. And, uh, uh, my lord, that's the Nash situation. Uh, and, my lord, in our uh, short submission on that is that Mr Justice Swift dealt with that appropriately, in particular at paragraph 24, his judgment, which your lordship has seen, and that this case is totally different 
uh, from uh, Nash in uh, that uh, respect. Um, Is that because when you decide to outsource entirely functions which the council would normally do itself, that is about um, the arrangements you're making to be more efficient. That's one way, certainly, of putting it. Um, but it is also, if one takes the expression that uh, Mr Justice Underhill, as he then was, uh, used, um, uh, high-level choices... Um, Obviously, high-level choices embrace uh, the outsourcing decision. Um, and that, of course, applies across a range, uh, if not potentially all, of a council's functions. It was pretty far-reaching in, in Barnett's case at that time. Whereas here, albeit we're talking about an important strategy, it's concerned only with recreational facilities, which indeed is a function which is a power of the council, not a duty of the council. So as high-level things go, uh, this is mid-level. I don't say it's low-level, but it's mid-level rather than high-level in those terms. So it's convenient moment. Lord, it is indeed. No, 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 no. <laughs> you haven't got much more of you, uh, Just going through a few cases. 